Well, um, hopefully you know the panel. Jenny Bates from Sense of the Earth, Mara Kodeshi from the London Assembly, Dr. Ian Mugway. Now, shall I just say King's College, is that yes. enough? Yes, I so, and, Alan, Alan Andrews from Fine Earth. So, um, I also have on my right here, Keith Taylor, who's uh, an MEP for the South East, um, and we have Simon Burkett from Campaign for Clear uh, in London. So, the experts are not just out here, but they're also out there. So, hopefully we can have a discussion as well as questions for the speakers. So, feel free to um, chip in uh, if you have something which you think is relevant. Um, so, can I ask... Do you have some questions for the speakers? Uh, can you say your name, please? My name is Ernest Hewitt, and I'm a representative of a residence association in Enfield. Uh, I don't know if you know the uh, 406. They've just updated the 406 running through Southgate and through Bowes wards. Uh, they not only updated it and made it into, a, 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 let's say, a six-lane jam, where it was a three-lane jam, uh, they're thinking of increasing the population around it at the same time. They have a housing association that wants to build right up into the 406 flats and knocking the original houses down, which were to, unfortunately derelict. Plus the fact that they're also building a housing estate, plus the fact they want to build a recycling plant on the 406 so it will increase traffic uh, by a thousand vehicles a day. My argument is, is, what's the law about building uh, multi-dwellings right up onto the side of, say, the 406? There's one for you, Alan, isn't there? I suppose it isn't. Planning law is not, not one of my, my strong points. But it, it is possible to challenge development using air quality laws. It can be quite a useful tool. And that's one of the, just one of the reasons we're really worried about this nitrogen dioxide limit being reduced because at the moment it's acting as a bit of a break on unsustainable development. To take Heathrow as an example, one of the reasons that has prevented a third runway at Heathrow is this argument that it couldn't be done without making NO2 worse and, and you'd never achieve compliance with NO2 limit if you built a third runway. So, so you can use it. It's, it's important to make sure that uh, an air quality assessment is done before to, to, to through the process of environmental impact assessment. Um, the problem is these assessments are often not done very thoroughly. Um, they often sort of gloss over air quality concerns and you know, make very glib statements that um, air quality effect will be will be minor. Yeah. And <laughs> there is no such thing as it. one of the things that planners often fail to understand is the relationship between air pollution emissions and concentrations. The impact on concentrations of a development like the one you're talking about can actually be, be quite small in terms of you know, one or two micrograms. And so planners look at that and think, oh well that's, that's, not, that's not a big deal. But actually if you look at the, the tons of emissions that you'd have to cut in order to achieve that kind of emissions reduction to achieve legal compliance, it, it's huge. So I'd, I'd say, just to, to summarise, yes, you can use air quality within planning disputes. It can be, it can be powerful. Um, I could put you in touch with some campaigners in Sheffield who recently successfully opposed a new Sainsbury's, sorry, an extension to a Sainsbury's in Sheffield on the basis that it would make air quality worse. So it can be used. Can I just um, uh, add something to that? I mean, I think what the, the panellists have all said is, is um, uh, tremendous uh, today. Um, I think in London, there are, there are two things. In London, there is something called the London Plan, which is, Jenny's referred to, it's the overarching plan for London. Everything else has to conform with it. And pages 229, 229 to 232, are on air quality, and they're a must-read for anyone who is campaigning, frankly, on just about anything environmental in London. Um, they, that particular bit of the London plan, uh, and Murad was a real champion on this when it was going through the London Assembly, um, require, it basically says, development should be at least air quality neutral and should not uh, worsen air quality where it's um, uh, um, you know, suffering legal breaches. 
but there, there's also some there are also some other powerful provisions in those um, in that policy, which basically says they cannot dump more pollution on vulnerable people when the standards are being breached, and they can't also dump vulnerable people, yeah, you know, on existing very bad pollution. So there are some very um, uh, strong um, legal requirements um, which they should meet, which I suspect you know, would really, um, uh, you know, if you pointed that out, make them think um, uh, again. I think the other point I'd make is that generally around the country, so for example, you know, in the southeast of England or, or anywhere else around the country, um, there are two things, and, and this is um, uh, you know, what, what Alan is fighting for, there are two things. The first is that the legal standards, these nitrogen dioxide limits um, or the, the particle limits, once you um, are below those, even you know, for a year, but once you're below those standards anywhere around the UK in ambient air, you know, in sort of um, the air that we breathe as the public, um, you're not allowed to do things which push air pollution above, so it's a sort of lockstep arrangement. And where it's being breached, you're not allowed to make it worse. So um, that applies right around the country under, under EU law. Um, so I think there's a, a London-specific thing, which you know, is important to all of us, but there's actually a sort of much wider thing for, for everyone around the UK. Can I just add on the London plan? Simon is right, there is a lot of provisions in the London plan on air quality basis for interventions or guidance at least for developers. Um, what I'm perturbed uh, by is actually that in some ways the enforcement side of it, it's making sure that they are required to, hasn't been done in the way that I think was envisaged. I've yet to hear of a test case where a development or a developer has been refused permission on the basis of uh, the report air quality impact. Um, we haven't got there yet, but there may be an instance in, in, in the case that you brought up. Your, your assembly member is Joanna McCartney. Yeah, I'm sure. I've, I've, I've had meetings with her. So there's, 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 that's the, the housing government. And I think we, we, we're, we're coming to view from the presentations, particularly from me, and maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be even putting the huge housing developments near major fruit fairs uh, and maybe to meet the American model. Not quite there, but there will be test cases, and maybe this is one. The other part of the question you asked about number one is waste facilities, mm -hmm. and that that is a, a real, uh, yeah, a difficult one to to, to, to deal with. Uh, insofar as London does need to renew all its waste facilities, uh, a new generation, um, certainly move away from the traditional incineration processes, um, but these new facilities will have to go somewhere, um, and. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about gasification, uh, Aaron and all, uh, MBT. Aaron, MBT, yeah. Uh, there's a whole set of technologies there. Uh, unfortunately, they are going to be uh, at the doorstep of some London residents rather than uh, m most of us. Um, and they're probably going to be put on the, the old industrial states in the suburbs, by and large. I've seen the displacement effect of change, uh, moving waste facilities when I was a councillor and city of Westminster. We decided to basically close, well, the, the, the majority group uh, in the city of Westminster decided to, to close down all facilities that we had on waste management and basically export it to other boroughs like Southern. So they actually had to deal with all the collection bans going and being disposed of. I, I don't know the particular impact in Enfield, but I think we need to be mindful of the London-wide context. And just, just to emphasise, I mean, the Med does have some very powerful powers to intervene and in one instance where I don't think he, he used them in the way that he should have done is uh, a case Jenny brought up, city airports. Um, the expansion there was actually given by the local authority there, Newham Council, without any consultation to join in boroughs. It was on that basis the Environment Committee actually investigated city airports uh, impact uh, and bizarrely, the mayor, when I did point this out to him, well, why, 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 why don't you, sh you should at least bring that in on the basis that this has an impact beyond just Newham, it's across London in terms of the airplanes and what have you. He simply said he didn't have the powers. Now, uh, my, my interpretation of that is, is how you interpret the laws that you've got and the powers, and you find a way of doing it. Um, but 
I, I will flag that up with my colleague Joanne McCartney and I'll take the details before I go and see. Do you have something to add to that, Jenny? Just very briefly, are you talking about Pink and Wave? Yeah. yeah right, <laughs> OK, so uh, the Greens have been active on this. I mean, our view certainly is that that is a huge um, proposal and it's much better to try and deal with waste in more smaller facilities and then you don't have that sort of huge traffic thing and I think air pollution to, 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 to fight that on air pollution grounds is absolutely right. Um, so um, yes, uh, I won't go into, you know, we don't believe in any of the combustion publicise and, and show really look, dig deep into those traffic traffic impact um, statements and the air pollution ones and, and don't believe as Alan said um, sort of insignificant or minor or anything else because you know actually I think that's what the Thames Gateway Bridge showed and you actually look at it it was going to take a receptor over when it shouldn't and and um, so yeah let's uh, liaise as well yes do you want to make a point Keith or? yes please go ahead <laughs> thank you I'm Keith Taylor I'm the MEP for the South East region and sadly, uh, air pollution is not a problem reserved for London. Um, but this is a really good meeting. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and I would like to say that when I was a councillor in Brighton before I became an MEP, um, we actually did refuse on air pollution grounds. There was a very busy road. Uh, and when the planning committee, of which I was a member, heard that the, retail, the uh, um, residential above ground floor retail would not be able to open their front windows because of the air pollution, we actually decided we weren't going to pass that application. Similarly, there was an application for um, a heat and um, combined heat and power system very close to a pollution hotspot, and which was on the edge of the European standards. But then we heard that it was going to throw it above. And so it was refused. So, but I think what's behind all this is that we have to actually find a way with a new national powers policy planning framework to actually make this stick. Part of that is around raising the public awareness of the problem. Um, and I probably won't get another chance to speak. So I'm going to give you a quick plug for this. It's a booklet that I produced for the public in the southeast region. It's, a, it's like a basic introduction to air pollution and it's called the invisible killer so please take take there's a few left at the back uh, and it's on my website if you need it and um, also listening very closely to what alan was saying about the uh, the uh, ref the revision of the um, air quality directive and the um, the truly awful um red tape challenge um certainly i i, I will be working along with my green colleagues um in in the parliament to uh, to make that less worse. <laughs> Great. Um, would you like to ask a question? Uh, Anna Mulmay. I'm not here representing any group, but I'm a sort of community activist, so I'm involved with a lot of groups locally, and I've got a sort of background in health policy analysis, particular interest in public health. I live in Hammersmith and Fulham, in Shepherd's Bush, um, so, uh, there's sort of a couple of questions, uh, just a general one about how does the NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, relate to the London um, plan? I mean, which would take precedence when it comes to nitty gritty? Because um, the uh, National Framework, I mean, is such a, a woolly document and it, it very much um, leans to favour development um, as against local communities. Um, certain question for sort of politicians through Murad and others. I mean, how can we most effectively um, lobby Boris on getting these um, uh, issues into the local health and well-being boards onto their agenda? Because I say, uh, my council, as I say, is uh, ide ideologically opposed to anything to do with Europe. Public health is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and um, really how can we do it? Yeah. Well, on, the, on the format, my understanding is the London plan is the main document, and they're actually going to change the national, you know, the national document has a carve out for London. Well, Jenny, they've just set out a consultation on revising the London plan again 
to yeah. make sure that it is consistent with the NPPF. Which so is, what's that acronym? Yeah. That is the National Planning Policy Framework. So this is what this lady is talking about. So yes. basically, the London Plan team have had to look at the, the London Plan, which they've just revised, and see how or not it conforms with the mm. NPPF. And they, 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 mm. they've thought so that it more or less does... Them. And there's a couple of bits where they don't think it is, and there's a couple of bits where they want to sort of change the references, whatever. Yeah. So that is a consultation that's happening now. Um, and so, but basically, so it has to come from the top down. So it has to come from national, and that's why London has to revise its strategy, and in turn, locals will have to revise their strategies. But interestingly, I read something that shows that the mayor, or the, the, the planning team, they actually want the London plan to be the quote, I think it was go-to document for developers. So they want the London plan to be, you know, something that developers can trust and, and everybody can trust, but it will have had to have been adjusted to make sure it conforms. Um, and we certainly fought, um, as Friends of the Earth, very hard to try and improve the MPPF um, and the localism bill, um, and we've got some, some sort of sustainable development um, definition in there, which was the biggest success, because there was the, the there is the national um, 2005 um, sustainable development strategy, and the criteria, the five guiding principles were the absolutely key key ones, and those have now been adopted as a, as a definition in the NPPF, and it includes living within environmental limits, um, as well as building a just society and a sustainable economy mm. and using sound science and good governance. So, you know, it touches on all the things. So, and, and that's what I was referring to. The principle of that is that you, you have to do things that don't trade, each other, trade off against each other that have to be met together. Mm. So, you know, that definition is in there. It's not, you know, as strong or as well organised or, or not in the localism act, but there is something in there uh, that we can try and use to show that it must be sustainable development and not just any development. But, <laughs> but words mean what you want. You know, I'm trying fine. to get that yeah. more into the London plan. Yeah. I struggle to get that into chapter one more of the London plan. Yeah. Two things. The first thing on the planning front, I'm not an expert, but um, uh, I, I would support any mayor, actually, uh, whoever they may be, as long as they've got a democratic mandate to make sure their vision, their London plan, is, is, uh, is, is seen as the, the documents over and above any national framework. Because I think it, 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 it shows the lines of, uh, of accountability more clearly uh, than, than, than the national framework, which, let's face it, only, only certain people know about. And, um, and, and very few of us actually uh, engage with. Come down, yeah, it's just pushed down. It doesn't. It's not part of the localism approach. What, what, what we're hearing from the coalition government. More importantly, though, the, the public health issue. I think that's that's an open open goal which we can determine given they're being set up. Uh, for those who don't know, the, 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 the most local authorities and across London, you will see public health and well-being boards put together. Uh, and we've, we've got to try and set the agenda. Yeah. Uh, hence why I thought, uh, and, and I think it came over at the, the health environment session we did on this front, but it, uh, it came from the City of London gentlemen actually, mm -hmm. that we should actually push this very hard. Because actually the emphasis there will be on preventative measures uh, rather than dealing with, with the, 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 uh, the, 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 the problems we've got now. And I think actually local authorities and the Mayor will be well positioned to do that. Um, at the same time, you know, on the health front, as, as I'm sure you know, we've got quite other battles like the A&E being closed in Hammersmith and the impact yeah. of that. But you know, that, 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 I didn't raise that in my opening introduction because I thought in the air quality context it's more important to get it into the public health agenda. And with all the scientific evidence we're, we're hearing from Ian, um, I think that there are ways and means of working because I think the NHS must have much of the data as, um, on, on, yeah. uh, beyond just the premature deaths, which yeah. we, we haven't really touched on. Yeah, well, what we want to know on the A&E thing, I mean, it's not just because if you've got something, if you've been in a serious accident or whatever, you want to go to a major centre which has the expertise, and there's no arguing about that, a lot of people don't understand that. But we want to know, I mean, what's going to replace them? Are there going to be the adequate minor injury units and all that kind of thing where a lot of the A&E traffic would go and be better treated there. You expected in, from the bush to go to St Mary's, which I don't think is... Anyway, that, that, that's, well, I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
can I just ask, does anyone have a question for Ian? <laughs> A scientist. Um, a scientist. Um, well, I, I was the general. I had one point to make okay. to the question about proximity to buildings and the fact that we were talking about the threshold of NO2 again. There is sufficient scientific literature to say distance from a busy road alone is an indicator of poor health. There's enough scientific evidence to suggest that it's unacceptable to build new housing within a buffer zone mm. of a major road, irregardless of whether you make estimates of what the NO2 levels are. And that's certainly the argument that I would make. And I liked the, what you quoted from the London Plan, mm. which is essentially putting vulnerable people in harm's way. And I think that's critical. But if you get completely obsessed with the threshold level, you lose a lot of the literature where sometimes they're saying, it's not clear to say it is NO2, but it's certainly something to do with proximity to roads or proximity with roads carrying certain types of traffic. And I think that's a big enough argument to take forward to those planning arguments. And that should be used to block development. Um, and the science would stand up. There's no doubt the science would stand up there. Yeah, well, thank you. We could, of course, uh, reduce the traffic and allow the de development to go ahead. That's another option, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'll take one more question because I, I think we're probably then at uh, the end of our question time. Uh, I'm uh, Danny Bates. I'm the London assistant to uh, Jean Lambert, who's the Green MEP for London. Uh, she can't be here, unfortunately, <coughs> herself. Uh, she's actually on her way to Pakistan. Uh, but my question is around the air quality, uh, the review of the air quality legislation at EU level. Uh, and more about the UK end of that. It's very worrying uh, what we've heard about how the UK government, through the Red, red Tape Challenge, wants to transform uh, the existing legislation and water down the NO2 re requirements. And certainly the Green Group in Brussels, with Keith and others uh, across the group, will do everything they can, and hopefully other MEPs too, to, to stop any watering down in that area. But my question is... Uh, are, I suppose it's more, more for Jenny and Murad, but, but for others may, may, may be able to comment too, on how uh, we can pressure, put pressure on the UK government on the UK. Because at the end of the day, what legislation comes through is also determined by you know, the member states, and that's an important element. So maybe the evidence side as well could, could be relevant. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll let Jenny and Murad speak on this one, but just a, an initial point. We can... We can do a lot of work in the Parliament, and we can do a lot of work with the Commission. I think the real danger lies in Council, where we sort of lose control of the, of the negotiation, and that's why it's absolutely essential that we have visibility and publicity in, each, in, in the Member States, so in the capitals, and so we need national level awareness uh, and focus on this issue if we're not to lose the battle in, in Council of Ministers. And I'm sure... Yeah, I, mean, I don't we'll have the, more the, ideas on yeah, how we do that. The point, well, the one point I, I will make on this front, um, unfortunately, on, on this front, uh, we have a government department, DEFRA, which is probably one of the poorest. And I think it's both uh, at the sector of state level and the department, from my experience. I was, I was making these comments earlier to someone discreetly. Um, and um, th th they have not actually got a handle on, on, on a lot of this. All the liaison we've had with them on... on, on, um, on um, poor air quality in London, I've never felt comfortable with them actually being on top of it. I think the minimum that they're, they're going around saying to themselves is that, is that we just need to comply and kick it into a long loss as long as possible the compliance with the EU limits. No, no aspiration or indication that we should go beyond that to reach who, uh, the, the World Health Organization levels and whatever. There's just been a general approach from DEFRA. And I, I've, I've come to the view, actually, it's both not just with the, uh, the civil servants, but also uh, with the ministers. Uh, whoever seems to be there goes native. Uh, when, when it was under a Labour, uh, Labour uh, minister, I, I tried knocking the door to get through to, to people and doing work then. Um, so I, I, I do think that the, 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 the finger can be pointed very firmly at DEFRA, not taking this issue on board nearly as seriously as, as they should. Um, I don't know what I could add. I mean, you know, we can only just try and build the momentum in every way. You know, publicity, activism, media, um, to try and get, you know, it is starting to get a momentum. Things are, things are you know becoming a bit more 
uh, serious uh, in their minds. Um, but um, it's it's very environmental issues are very hard at the moment at all. Um, and this has got more traction than than you know something like climate change now. But it's still it's still very hard. Um, and that's why that whole message about you know if you you know in, even in austerity you use the, your money to make win 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 and not. To, to, to do things that go the wrong way, but um, you know we're, we're we're struggling to get that message through about even something like you know green jobs from um, renewable energy. You know, I mean massive potential, but the the, the feed-in tariff they were cutting, and you know, so it's 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 a hard one, but um, that we've got to do that. I mean, and that's why the mayoral election was so so important to try and make people realise what they were voting for if they got Boris, who wasn't going to do anything and. You know, Ken was going to do. You know, would have would have done much more, um, and and so would the others. Uh, and obviously, the Greens uh, came top of our ranking <laughs> um, um, completely. But um, so, you know, we've just got to, to to do what we can for all of us in terms of using using the, the good science, using the media, using using the people. But um, yeah, I'm not sure I can say anymore. <laughs> I think air quality is one of those issues that works best at a very local level um, and that's how you, you build awareness and that's how you, you raise concern and, and that sort of local level action and awareness raising feeds into these kind of high level discussions that we're talking about in the 2013 review and can really support, support our process. Sounds like a good reason to have a network to me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, um, thank you Jenny, Murad, Ian, Alan. Um, we have had some fantastic speakers, I think you'll agree, and if you could just show your appreciation. Um, thank you for those questions as well. Now, um, if people want to come to your conference this afternoon, then uh, can we say quarter past two?